Welcome to Soul Night Live episode number 121. Today my guest is Roger Joseph Manning Jr. Hey Roger, how's it going? Good to see you. Good to see you. Greetings. Likewise. Um, wow, it's been a few years since uh, you've been on the show and you've done some pretty cool stuff since then, so I'm glad to hook back up with you and kind of catch up on what's been happening since then. And I got a whole bunch of cool stuff to check, uh, check with you about. Um, I guess let's just get started with what's on your plate this year coming up. Right. Well, uh, thankfully, Beck has been more active on the road. Um, so we've got some stuff booked uh, in the summer. Uh, we're doing everything from, you know, traditional, like, live full band type stuff to uh, he's been exploring performing solo in front of a uh, local symphony orchestras um and uh thankfully he'll bring jason and i out to add some extra keys add some extra guitar bass um and do some background vocals with him uh and we did one last year in orlando that went really well it was very exciting have you um, ever played with a symphony before i have but that's because i've done you know classical and jazz stuff over the years but not really in a rock scene. So okay. it was very, uh, it was very Emerson, Lake and Palmer in the round. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. That, that 77 tour that they couldn't afford to pay the orchestra. So they had to get rid of yeah. them after about a month. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Well, nobody could ever say those guys didn't think big. <laughs> I think that was the whole point. Uh, and then, <laughs> and then yeah. we got punk rock as a reaction. Yeah yeah among other things yeah um so okay so that's going to be happening are you gonna is it gonna be like a tour symphonic tour kind of thing or they're figuring it out um i think they're gonna try to do a string of dates and some stuff in europe too but it all remains to be seen but at least it's being talked about okay people are excited about it um and then i'm just freelancing away uh you know the the EP extended EP radio days from last year. You know, that was kind of a good six, seven run promoting that. Uh, so it's time for me to look at getting some more material together. <laughs> if I can squeeze that in. Uh, but, um, yeah, just, uh, freelancing and, uh, I'm doing everything from playing on people's solo projects here at home. Uh, to working on uh, ambient, like meditation music with a partner of mine. Um, uh, that, that actually goes by Ancient Future Technologies, if anybody wants to look that up. Okay. And uh, it helps you uh, fall asleep and relax and mission accomplished. <laughs> have, you, have you tested it yet? <laughs> it's, uh, it's a whole other hat for me to wear, and it's been fun using all my toys here to explore that. But I'm still very new at it and just kind of getting my legs, figuring that out. But I'm enjoying it. My part, partner approached me with that. Um, what else? Uh, but I'm, I'm doing a lot of singing on people's uh, projects. There's a guy named uh, Michael Carruthers who's working on some solo stuff. Um, he's an independent artist, uh, and uh, he's having me sing, arrange, and sing a lot of backgrounds. Of his material um so it it's all over the place uh but i like it that way i like the variety now somebody saw this and thought hey i'd love to have roger play on my album is that a possibility if they contact you 100 percent. in fact okay. uh got started doing that more after my glamping ep kind of mm -hmm. offered that as a uh fan experience and it really took off and of course we did it with licorice quartet mm -hmm. uh so i continue to do that and um i've been very happy uh how many folks out there have i mean it can be, it's anything from like i've got one song that i just want some keyboards on to i'm doing a whole record what would you charge to put background vocals on a bunch of tracks or arrange some strings or singing uh, i'm sorry uh, keyboards so uh, it's everything in between. And then, you know, just kind of figure out what everybody's budgets are and take it from there. Uh, obviously, I can't do it for free. So 
I kind of figure what the workload is like, mm -hmm. like what, you know, um, do they want Queen and Def Leppard vocals on the whole song or do they want just some, um, you know, simple uh, Louis, uh, Louis. Uh, backgrounds? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. So you have the Louis Louis price bracket and then you have the Bohemian Rhapsody yeah. one and then other ones. And they're, they're very vast. Right. <laughs> vast difference. Okay. Well, folks, if you're thinking about it, drop Roger a line, you know. Um, there's no time like now, you know, do it. <laughs> yeah, uh, the easiest way is to go to uh, my website, which unfortunately is Roger Joseph Manning Jr. Official dot com. If somebody okay. else hijacked the regular name, I don't know what happened. Okay. Uh, but every, everything is on there. Uh, and then just reach out to me and we'll figure it out from there. Okay, that sounds good. All right. Well, it's actually, done. when I'm touring, uh, it actually is a great thing to do from the road. Uh, well, especially keyboards. Vocals are a little more difficult, but I have a lot of, you know, afternoons off in a hotel room. And uh, I wouldn't say I'm bored, but it, working on music really helps me stay focused. Well, I was um, going to ask if you like had kind of a touring recording rig that you took with you and worked on yeah. some downtime. I have, it's basically all on the computer. I have a little keyboard controller. I throw in my suitcase. Um, and I even, you know, I even have ways to record vocals, but it's just too loud. Like I can't be shouting in my hotel room. All the, all the guests will complain, right. but I can do, I've done a ton of keyboards for people, you know, with my headphones. On. Um, okay. And uh, with all the software that's out there available, there's, Really, no shortage of sound. If you want any of these toys, you got to wait till I get home, but that's fine. Sure. Well, I think a lot of folks do that. You know, it's funny. I had um, Trevor Rabin on here a few months ago, and his brother, or excuse me, his son, Ryan, is a producer. And he was wow. talking about, he's like, we're literally on a plane flying somewhere, and he's sitting there mixing an album on the laptop, yeah. you know? So it's like you can do amazing things with just a laptop these days that. I'm sure people wouldn't even be able to discern the difference between that and, you know, a, a big full studio in some cases. That's pretty crazy. It's kind yeah. of neat, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. me out. Um, so let's talk about Radio Days. Um, that was the most recent EP you have, and it came out last fall. It's still readily available, so check it out, folks. Um, it's a four-song EP. Not unlike glamping, and I think you even kind of put them together. Um, like if you buy Radio Days, you'll get glamping also, and together they're like side A and B of one full-length album. Is that right? Yeah, uh, Omnivore Recordings, who are a great label, especially for a lot of uh, they re reissued Jellyfish stuff um, on vinyl, and they just do a lot of incredible like legacy and retrospective packages, um, and uh, it was their idea since they weren't involved with the glamping piece, why don't we piggyback these together? Because glamping was in 2018. That was a while ago. Let's piggyback them. And then we'll add a bunch of B sides for, you know, special encouragement. So there's like, there's live tracks on there of the handful of live shows I've played. So I'm, I'm so thankful. Not only it was recorded, uh, but my bandmate, Chris Price, who played in the band with me, he, he mixed them, did a great job. Uh, and then there's even some instrumentals for all the muso fans who enjoy uh, hearing my tracks. Do you ever get a chance just to go play for fun, like around town with friends or anybody? Not really. Uh, because there's many reasons. But interestingly enough, there's a gentleman here in Tenor, just met last year, playing on his record. His name is Will Warden, W-O-R-D-E-N. And he is... A younger guy in his 20s that just has really embodied the spirit of kind of classic country era of the 60s and 70s. And he writes songs that good. And his voice and everything, he's just kind of, well, I, I don't want to say he's there, but that's all I've heard him do. Right. Perhaps he can do all kinds of other things, but this seems to be where he's focusing at the moment. Um, and it's really fun to play his material. So we did a whole record last year that's going to be uh, coming out shortly. Uh, very independent. I don't think he signed to a label or anything. Uh, so it'll be on Spotify and stuff very soon. But um, it was so much fun to make because uh, it really has all that um, energy of like Jerry Reed and uh, 
uh, Waylon Jennings, Buck Owens. Um, uh, it just really has that spirit. Uh, Jack Jones. And um, I've always admired that music from afar, but it's not like I get up and practice that every day. And it's certainly not, it's not what I grew up doing. Uh, so it was a really educational experience for me because he knows the difference, but when you're kind of faking it or when you kind of have the, the right spirit and attitude and you've got a great collection of players together here in Los Angeles. Uh, most of the guys I didn't know. And uh, we're actually playing a show on Friday night. So I've been practicing a way for that. So yes, I do occasionally play and jam with my friends, but there's, there's nothing jamming about these tracks because there's lots of chords and, you know, country is kind of like a uh, good jazz, very deceptive. It's like, You've got a hundred chords and all this musicality flying by, but that's not what you're hearing. You're just enjoying the melodies, you know? Um, so it's not very easy per se, uh, even though it can sound like it's easy, <laughs> right? Sure. I mean, the, the pedal steel player, for example, has the hardest job because that's one of the most difficult instruments to play. But if somebody's playing it properly and with any kind of competence, it just sounds like it's floating and you're drifting and you're dreaming, you know, floating down the stream. And yet there's all these kind of things he's doing with his hands and his feet and his knees, bending the pedals, blah, 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 blah. Oh, it's so, amazing. Yeah. I mean, I played with a guy yeah. in the past year. Um, every month we do a, a tribute theme jam. One month it might be music from the 80s. This month it's stuff from Broadway musicals. And, um, yeah, we, we all we like to think big when we can. Um, and uh, he doesn't always sit in with us, but some months he does. And I sit next to him, and I'm just amazed at what he does. And, you know, what's kind of fun is to try and get him to play something totally out of context, like a metal riff on there. Like I was like, play Inner Sandman. And I just we would just yeah. fell off our chairs laughing when he started sliding around doing that. You know, because yeah, it's the it's the country or Hawaiian version of Inner Sandman. Yeah, and you know, I don't think he listened to any rock, so he was kind of looking at me like, "You think this is fun?" And it's like, "Yes, <laughs> I, I totally love it when you take instruments out of context and do fun things with them." So, sure. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, let's talk a bit about the songs on the EP, for starters, and there's four of them. Um, tell me about the opening track, I Feel Good, I Feel Good, I Feel Fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, man, that was a song I wrote way back during uh, After Spilt Milk. Jellyfish was still together. Um, as is always the case, I didn't have any lyrics. I either finished the lyrics almost at the very end, uh, or I have, you know, brilliant collaborators I've teamed up with and have been fantastic lyricists. Um, but I really just kind of liked the very kind of straightforward sing-along, uh, beatle bad finger. Um, it's a very, very kind of nostalgic song, but instead of being driven with a strumming guitar, it's got the piano on there. Uh, Eric Dober sings the harmony with me because it's very much a duet, as you can mm -hmm. hear. Uh, it's not, you need both voices to execute that melody. And um, it just kept getting pushed aside for whatever reasons. Other songs were ahead of it in the race. And uh, I decided it was time to finish it. And it would be, it's a very innocent, playful, just kind of fun rock, rock tune. Um, uh, I played drums on that. Uh, Chris Price played bass. But it, it, again, there are, all the songs are always experiments. Uh, I have little goals in mind. And it's kind of like, okay, let's see if I can figure out how to do that. Because somewhere down there, I think it can work. So I thought it would be just a fun, innocent way to open up the album. Yeah, it's just a little short one to kind of get things rolling and kind of give you an introduction and get things rolling in a fun way. Okay, and then we lead into Rockin' It Our Way, which is kind of more fun, a little more elaborate. Um, what's yeah, it's more it's that? more elaborate, more anthemic, and so it was kind of, you know, that should have been the album opener, actually. <laughs> but thought I'd slide in. Uh, Rockin' It Our Way, I wrote during my days in Imperial Drag. 
Um, and uh, again, it just got pushed out of the way for other tunes. And of course, we didn't stick together long enough to make a second album. But it was another one of those tunes I always believed in. Um, the biggest question was how I was going to arrange the background vocal. Oh, and it didn't have a bridge. There was no, just the two sections, mm. verse and chorus. And then I wrote the bridge many, many, many years later when I knew it was time to finish the song. I think it was in 2015. And thankfully, the bridge, as you can hear, it made a good intro. I, I use a portion of the bridge to start the song. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was handy. So I had an arrangement flushed out. But then it was like, well, this song's not going to have that big Susie Quattro party sound unless I can get the big group vocal happening. So I sang the backgrounds with uh, my friend Blue McCauley, another incredible music maker here in Los Angeles. Great writer and singer in his own right. He's mostly done producing and writing for other people. But I knew his, I knew his, voices, his voice would blend well with mine. He sang on glamping a bit too. Um, and we, he and I constructed all the, we sang all the backgrounds on that song, which it just took forever. But you can hear it very large sounding. And uh, I really wanted to finally do a song that had the energy of one of my favorite bands ever, which was The Sweet. And I oh, think yeah. it, you know, th- that whole era, I mean, Jellyfish explored it for sure. And Imperial Drag, it's always been a part of why I wanted to get into this world but uh that early 70s phase 70s phase of british glam you know i'm just as big a fan of all the prog that's happening at that time but i also love all that bubblegum radio oh, teen, too, man. teenage energy that's happening i remember that. when i was about five i had a record from ktel called fantastic hits i still have it all these years later and lily little willie was on that and that was like my yeah. favorite song i would just play it yeah. over and over again and listening to the suite all these years later, I just, I marvel at the background vocals from that bass player. My God, these high stuff, man. It's just like, wow. Yeah. You know? no, they're another one of those crazy bands. Uh, and there were so many other good bands at the top and they get overlooked. And, and, you know, I mean, I very much, <laughs> very much relate to them. I mean, they really took the visual side of that era almost as far as you could take it. I mean, I say that knowing full well some of the costumes that Elton John walked out on stage in. But, uh, you know, Elton, Elton's songwriting always came from more of a singer-songwriter. There was a classicism to it, an, an air of um, sophistication and, you know, sweet came from being like a 60s bubblegum entity. And... A lot of people, it's just easy to, to blow them off, but they wrote some of the best 70s rock, in my opinion, ever. Oh, they did. And, and kind of glammy, too. I mean, would you say that? Great- tough. It's tough. It's like our gang's going to kick your ass and. And, and we're going to wear makeup while we do it. Exa- exactly. So <laughs> really, particularly in later generations, they're just, you introduce sweet to them, they're just confused. Uh, it's much like Sparks. They don't, this just sounds like opera and silly. Like, but, but uh, you know, Sparks is also one of the toughest, hardest rocking groups you know, of the time. I'm going to bring them up, actually. I knew you would be hip to them long before the documentary that broke them open a couple of years <laughs> ago. And I wasn't. I, I'd never even heard of them. But it was uh, to have a group that's been around for almost 50 years and there's like 25 albums to dig into. Yeah. I love that. You know, it's yeah. like, I know what I'm going to do for the next two years and it's going to be a lot of fun. And oh man! Was. And then I went and saw them live. You know, at first I saw the documentary about Sparks, and I was like, "Well, I'm intrigued. I don't know if I like this, right. but boy, I'm intrigued." And then I saw them live a few months later, and I was like, "Oh, I get it. I'm in. You know, this is this is awesome, awesome." And Russell, I, his vocals. I mean, he's one of the greatest rock vocalists ever, and nobody knows who he is. And he still sounds amazing at like 75. I, <laughs> it boggles the mind, you know. And they're still, they're still writing songs that they could have written in their 20s or 30s. Yeah, did you hear the most recent album, The Girls Crying in Her Latte? Uh, only part of it. I, I haven't heard the whole oh, thing. Go yet. sit down and listen to the whole thing, because it's just like, it's a, almost a retrospective in a way, you know. There's the 
kind of short guitar driven punky kind of songs you know they 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 had the they were way ahead of the curve i mean they were playing punk five years before it was a thing they were playing synth rock five years before it was a thing you know they just kept evolving and and um just amazing. I guess we could just talk about them now and we'll get back to things in a minute. But I, yeah, I, I no, uh, discovering them. I mean, so when I was a teenager, they were kind of in their new wave phase. Yeah. And they, yeah. they had a they had a few hits with that. And I thought they were okay, but I wasn't like, this is my favorite band. Right. And uh, there was a local band here in Los Angeles in the late eighties that you might've heard of called Celebrity Skin. Um, and they were just fantastic they couldn't they never got a major label deal while other groups did like jane's addiction and stuff and chili peppers and this was all kind of out of the same 80s los angeles scene but celebrity skin wrote the best songs they were like one of the greatest i mean literally power pop and i emphasize the word power but they're not they're not talked about because they 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 didn't get out of los angeles much but in la it was sold out sold out venues like all, every time uh, and they were a really big deal for several years um, and I had the pleasure of meeting them I was such a fan and I met them uh, and was just showering them with compliments and I said I mean I hear I hear my record collection but I think there's stuff into that I don't know about like oh all we listened to <laughs> they were exaggerating but they said all we listened to is early Alice Cooper and Sparks <laughs> well, I and I knew my Alice, Alice Cooper. Cooper. I was like, I go, what do you mean, Sparks? They go, well, they had albums in the early seventies. I go, I don't know those records. And they're like, they're like tapping me on the head, going, you better go do your Sparks homework. Yeah. And it was just like, it changed everything. For oh, me. those seventies albums. I mean, the eighties ones have their moments. Of but course, those, that run of the ones, you know, the first one up through um, another number one in heaven is just an amazing run of records that just. Yeah are so inspired and so quirky and so unpredictable you know the arrangements are just never go where you think they're going to go neither do the chords and it's like a lot of it's very simple but unpredictably put together you know, it's, it's not like the perfect but those guys embody as do several of my favorite groups but it's is a constant marriage between uh simple sing-along energy rock pop with just enough sophistication to keep it interesting, little twists here and there, just a intellectualism po pokes out here and there, uh, and that's just always the most rewarding for me. And they they are they're masters of that. Oh, they are, and you know, uh, still most people don't know who they are. I mean, the documentaries made a big difference, but still, a lot of people don't know. And I'm, you know, I kind of tell them it's like if you like the snarky quality of. Todd Rundgren, The Tubes, Zappa, and um, groups like that, then Sparks isn't much of a stretch, you know, because the lyrics, I'd say, you know, kind of start with the lyrics because the lyrics yeah. are so, they're funny, but there's an undercurrent of seriousness, like, and it's hard to explain, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, and you literally, like, you can extend it, like, if you're an Evo fan, you'll probably like them. If you like The Damned, if you like Queen, if you like, I mean, it all, I think because they're, they were American, like Southern California, 50s kids. And then they really launched their career in England, where you get a lot more of that art school happening than you ever do in the States. Um, and those hybrids really add up to something just unique and incredible. Very special. And, um, and boy, they went through bands there for a while. You know, it's you know they have that song "Throw It Away and Get a New One." Well, they might as well be talking about their bands. Yeah. You know, because there's just it, they, and they were all great. You know, I mean, the drummer on that album, the Big Beat, is just amazing. I don't know who he is, but I don't remember. It's, it's, it's top notch. Big Beat is a heavy rock. It's such a heavy record. Oh yeah, it's like it's such a cool left turn for them at that time because they just finished um, what was it, Indiscreet, the one with the yeah. crashed airplane on the cover, and that was like their Sergeant Pepper Tony Visconti album, and it's like okay, we did that, now we're going to strip it back, and this I don't know if punk was a reaction, but it, their urge to strip things back happened around the same time. Yeah. So did you ever see them in that movie Roller Coaster where they're 
playing soccer. I did. Big beat. Yeah, man. That's I remember that as a, as a team. Yeah, it's uh, worth, worth just digging out for them, you know. <laughs> yeah. Not exactly the greatest uh, plot ever, but <laughs> you know, it's almost That's laughable. Good seventies um, disaster film genre. Yeah, exactly. Um, did you ever see Sparks? I've had the pleasure of seeing them several times. Uh, we even co-headlined with them on some Beck shows. Oh, wow. Uh, I've had many friends be in the band. I, I, I kid you not, over the years, you know, the recent years, like last 10 to 15 years, I've had five or six friends that have been uh, involved in some version of the band, mm-hmm. uh, which has been fantastic. Um, I got to see them when my friend Steve McDonald from Red Cross is playing bass. Uh, I got to see them do... Um, kimono my house in its entirety um and then beck was in japan touring and so were they so we got to go see some shows there with some different friends of mine playing in fact tyler lock sorry taylor lock who plays guitar on both my eps Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit him and jason faulkner at different times uh taylor was in sparks for a little while so just this it's been this crazy um you know, and then, well, you'll you'll appreciate this while we're talking. But, so we were touring in Europe in 2018. And my wife, Laurel, was with me. And we get on the bus one day to start our road trip for the day to the next show. And we're the first one on the bus. And there's this stranger sitting on the couch in the lounge. And we're like, uh, no one's introducing us. Like, I don't know who you are. What's going on? And then they shut the door and yeah. headed down the highway with this guy. Oh, right. Now he seemed personable enough. He's very nice, you know, mild mannered. And finally, we just Laurel will talk to anybody. So she strikes up a conversation with him. Starts talking. About, oh, you you work in the fi- you work in film. Oh, oh, you're a director. Okay, blah 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 blah. And it turns out it's the guy who would eventually go and direct the Sparks documentary. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, he's directed all these other films. He was there as a guest of Beck. They were friendly. Okay, cool. And his name is slipping me right now. Edgar. Edgar, Edgar. Rice. I forget his last name. Sorry. I, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, Beck's in the documentary. Did you yeah, see exactly? That? Yeah, 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 yeah. Among other people. But this was way back in 2018. So we were like, oh, okay, that's who you are. I've seen that fantastic, really nice work. And I go, so what? What are you working on these days? He goes, well, a very special project that. I don't know how many people are going to care about, but it's the greatest thing in the world to me. And you know, do you know the band Sparks? And Laurel and I go, yes. <laughs> like they're only one of our favorite groups. I'm I'm getting their documentary off the ground. We're like, we, what? We couldn't. Like, there, somebody's finally making a documentary, and you're the guy. I mean, this. So it, those types of seemingly random, crazy events often happen on a on a Beck tour. <laughs> uh, but we couldn't have been more excited. We were just showering him with praise. And he goes, oh, yes, yes, yes. They're the nicest people. I'll introduce you, introduce you to them tonight at the show, because that was one of the where there were two shows on the British tour that we were going to co-headline with them. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want to be that kind of groupy guy. I don't want to bother them. You know, he goes, no, 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 it'll, it'll, it won't be a problem. They're the nicest people in the world. And uh, sure enough, um, after their show, no, right before they were going to go on, he said, oh, you need to come meet them. Get your picture taken. I don't want to do that. I know how important pre-show privacy time is for me and my bandmates. I don't want to be that guy's like, hey, I'm a friend of, friend of Edgar's. You don't know me, but let me interrupt you while you're trying to warm up and get ready to go on stage. But he insisted, and I said, and Laurel was like, if you don't take him up on an offer, you might not ever get to meet them. And I said, well, you're, you could be right. And if it feels weird, I'll excuse myself. But they couldn't have been sweeter. I got to talk keyboard world. With Ron, huh? With Ron. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, I got to ask you? him about my favorite song, which is Thank God It's Not Christmas. Oh, I love that favorite song. Yep. Yeah, it's almost like joy to the world on crack, you know. <laughs> it's so unbelievable. And My favorite uh, one is um, Up Here in Heaven. I just love the chromatic quality of that chord progression. It's just great. And how it just starts with the, immediately, it's like, 
go. Then the vocals start and the whole song just doesn't let up. I think Kimono is probably my favorite, but man, I I love them. I love most all of them. And have you heard any of the stuff they've done in the last 10 years or so? Bits and pieces. Oh, man. I, I, haven't, I haven't heard all of it. The last three are like a trilogy, almost like um, Kimono, Propaganda, and Indiscreet. It's kind of like a trio in my mind anyway. Yeah, I, I agree. I totally um, agree. It's I like a, a modern agree. trio, like Hippopotamus, um, Steady Drip, 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 and Girls Crying in Her Latte. Like, as good as their 70s stuff. I, I will. I love that. Yeah. yeah well, that, so if you have time... You, to like just listen to the fun, do check them out. Before we move on, um, Ron, as a synth player and a keyboardist, could you share a little bit of what you just think about his style? And would you say he was a bit of a, a synth pioneer, kind of hooking up with Marauder and cranking out that album? Well, that you know, I mean, I sure, any, anybody who worked with Marauder back then, that was all uh, an incredible time to expand in the kind of dance and pop genres electronic keyboards in the way that like prog had not mm -hmm. done. it was a, it was a different school and uh yeah i mean those sparks records with giorgio is definitely part of that um i just think it's hilarious that ron played the the rmi electric piano for so much of that music for so long he became identified with their with sparks down mm -hmm. because most people don't know what it is and you don't have to know it just sounds like it's just it's in there rocking with the guitars um and the funny thing about that instrument is it's pretty much a one-trick pony uh so to get to get so much mileage out of it album after album uh is crazy to me uh and just just the coolest um but I really see, you know, it, it, I don't remember the documentary, but I think like a lot of kids, you either started on guitar or your parents gave you, you know, piano lessons kind of thing. Every family had some cheap living room piano um, or, a, again, a cheap acoustic guitar sitting around. Uh, that's how a lot of people got started. And keyboards were never cool. It, you know, when rock hit and the, then the British invasion, you were playing guitar or don't even expect to, you know, have a chance with the girls. Right. It wasn't going to be, you're going to be on the drums or guitar. And uh, it seems to me that Russell, I'm sorry, Ron, he, um, he just said, well, I can already play keys. And it was, it was a writing tool for him. So, they all, he also kind of brings in some neoclassical stuff once in a while, which is also part of their sound, which you can hear like the guys in ABBA did that too. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, it's got a modern European royalty to it. Yeah. Which can get, which can get cheesy really quick, but it never does for me when, when Ron's doing that. Um, it still rocks. That's the whole point. It has to still be tough. And I, again, the documentary, uh, because the Sparks as adults, to me, I very much related to, they were kind of, they were just kind of music nerds. You can tell like, oh, they probably didn't fit in at their high school. And they were, you know, they, they escaped through music and their weird, nerdy culture. Well, no, especially Ron, they were full on jocks in school. That's right. Who would have guessed? And, and, and I think that's, that's important because um, I think that's where a lot of the, the controlled testosterone, if you will, comes through in their music. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, they're, 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 they've read too many books. They're too cultured. Right. So you get this beautiful hybrid. I mean, that, you know, that, that's, again, that's how a lot of my heroes are. Um, uh, you know, cheap, cheap trick is always just like in your face, just good American punk pop, but there's all of these little clever twists here and there. And, and, uh, same with queen. And that's, that's just so important to me, but, um, I like, I like 
what Sparks' unique version of that is. Oh, yeah. I love it. It's brought a lot of a lot of happiness to me in the past few years since I discovered them. And um, That's so cool. I really like to see them again. I hope they come around and do another one. I imagine they're probably working on another album now. I'd love to have them on the show, too, but I wouldn't even know how to get through to them. But if anybody out there does, drop me a line. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's get back to the EP. Um, so we talked about rocking it our way. Um, what about I'm starting a band? What inspired that one? Well, on its surface, it was just me kind of. Is this the one with the harpsichord on it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember I wrote that song on the piano. Um, and I was going through a period, certainly in Jellyfish and afterwards, where I was exploring lots of Burt Bacharach type chord progressions and melodies. I was very much kind of in that mode often. Mm-hmm. Um, and this song was born out of that, but, uh, I knew that as I finished it with the lyric and the ranging that I didn't want to be some Dion Warwick piece with, with violins and, and so forth. I, I'd, I'd explored that before. So it was, I was very excited to see if I could pull off an interesting arrangement with entirely with keyboards. Which is which is what I did. That, that song is very very synth heavy. Yeah, it's got the harpsichord that drives it, but then it goes into all this territory with all these pieces in in my room. And um, sometimes that was easy, and sometimes it was really hard. Like I would arrange myself into a corner. I was like, man, if I'm not careful here, it's going to just turn into the Disneyland electrical parade. It's gonna it's mm-hmm. gonna become to we're going we're gonna to lose some of the romantic sentiment and somber you know just that kind of romanticism i didn't want it to become too cheap or funny or silly which you always run the risk with with electronics you can sure um just cast so, just cast but i think i finally came wrong <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh and then you know the middle of that bridge which i wrote years after the song because <laughs> that's how my timeline has gone uh that bridge is you know that's supposed to be like 1930s crooner coming off of a gramophone device with the tap it's very ghostly haunting the, the tap dancer and stuff that that's all conscious and deliberate, you know, not unlike you would do for a score or a musical. Um, and the challenge was not going there. The challenge was how do I get back to the original vibe of the song? Uh, but I figured it out. Well, that's a lovely tune. I really like it. And um, thank you. It has um, reminds me of some of your other tunes that you've done on harpsichord, like um, Survival Machine and. Oh yeah, those other ones, and uh, it's a, a really nice sound. Um, what board do you use for that harpsichord sound? Well, because I don't own a real harpsichord, and even if I few do, they're really, they're really hard to record. Oh really? So even even if uh, there are places where I could rent one, but I'd have to book a studio, the expensive microphones, it, it, it's insanely costly. Uh, so I was able to uh, cheat a little bit because I knew I knew synthesizers were going to surround the main harpsichord. So actually what happens on that recording is I stack samples and I stack synthesized harpsichord. I, I'm, I'm not kidding you. At one point, there are about seven sounds that make up just the harpsichord body. Oh, wow. Because if you're not careful, it can get too thin and it mm-hmm. just becomes transparent and you, you'll lose it. Like as soon as I start singing, you'd be like, where's the harpsichord? And you want, you need the, um, enough of the chordal information, the harmony, uh, to provide a bed to the vocal or it's not going to work musically. So I would just, I have no shortage of ways to stack harpsichord type sounds, synthesized harpsichords from, and then you can detune them and you, you thicken it up. Mm-hmm. So you get this big, juicy harpsichord that's marching through the tune. Kind of chorus. Um, 
Yeah. And some places it's thinner, some places it's thicker, you know, and you don't, you you're doing all that while trying not to draw attention to it. You don't want to, you don't want the listener to listen to the harpsichord. The harpsichord is just supposed to provide a framework. Right. Well, that's a really unique tune. I really like it. Um, and then closing the album, kind of, I guess, your most epic song of the four, um, On Our Way to the Moon. I think that's probably my favorite of the batch, um, especially that ending bit. It's wow. just so beautiful. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you know, Tell me a bit about that one's inspiration. That was another song I had the A and B sections for. I was pretty confident about that. But there was no arrangement, and there certainly wasn't that ending. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew <clears throat> for some reason, I just kept feeling like this shouldn't have a little bridge in it. And so I started entertaining this very elaborate, hypnotic, repetitive outro that just kept building and building and building. Um, and one day I was messing with some of the chords that you hear on the en- ending and it became like a chordal exercise. I was just fascinated by these harmonies and how they were moving in and out from each other. I was, I was hoping if I was going to succeed at all, that it would have some kind of Tony Banks Genesis um, mood to it, where he, he's just such a master at weaving these very interesting harmonies together that are kind of classical, but not really. They don't sound traditional classical. Um, they're very much unique to him his keyboard approach. Oh yeah. These two chords I was messing with kind of gave me that feel. And I said, well, what if I completed this idea and you just kind of wanted to hear it over and over again, because there's, there's eight chords that last about 30 seconds each before the cycle repeats. So you're either, again, it's like a good prog song. You're either floating in it and you're enjoying that or you're not right. Because if you don't like the mood that's happening, you don't you don't want to hang out there, right? But I, so I was hoping that I was creating this mood that you just kind of wanted to keep drifting in, and it would have a long fade. But I decided at the end of the day not to fade it because I liked how it just kept building. Anyway, that's that's how that happened, and it almost has nothing to do other than the lyric harmonically with the first half of the song. As soon as we get there, it just modulates into a whole other key. And I want I wanted there to be this like gear shift. Um, you know, because I'm talking about on our way to the moon, um, and how it's just me and my special friend. It's our imaginary play world, just for us. Nobody else has to know about it. And it's almost like we're talking about, you know, building the imaginary spaceship. And so the ending of the song becomes, well, the spaceship's now taking off again in our imagination. So I wanted to sound like we've left this kind of familiar earthly plane and now we're going into uncharted territory in the unknown in outer space. It's very cartoony and playful. Again, it's from a, well, how would, how would kids think of that? And as kids, we don't care that we don't have a real spaceship. We've gotten some giant cardboard boxes that our parents' refrigerator came in and we're chopping it and taping it and we're, our imagination is running the whole thing. We're projecting the perfect spaceship on this board box. Okay. Yeah. You know, what I like to do with the box is, <laughs> is sit on it and pretend it's a boat. <laughs> <laughs> I, some neighbors had one that we played on one fun summer day in the seventies. Then I went back the next day after it had rained and I'm like, Ooh, can we sit on the box again? And we went out in the backyard and it was just a soggy pile. In the oh yeah. <laughs> That wasn't gonna work. Yeah. No. Anyway, I mean, you get the you get the whole point. So hopefully that my my one of the greatest joys for me, and it's always a puzzle that I enjoy exploring is you know I've just described the attitude of the song. Well, in my mind, it took forever, but in my mind, I reflected that through the music, through my chord choices, the instrument choices, et cetera, et cetera hopefully the listener agrees um and to this day i marvel you know we, we talk about sparks and all these other bands that you and i probably have in common that we enjoy but it's really it's really the kind of golden era of prog 
where they either they either do this successfully or not. And I know it's almost trite and predictable and cliche to say, but some of those early prog bands, they kind of wrote the book. They broke the mold. So I, I, I've, to this day, I'm in awe with how the five guys in Yes or the five guys in Genesis, just two examples, in very different ways because they both had very different writing approaches. Oh, yeah. But they had the same five instruments. They, they, you know, they both had guitar, bass, drums, and some multi-keyboards and a singer. And it's very easy to transport me to these other worlds and just like, that, that, you know, that reflect those Roger Dean pieces of artwork, that oh, yeah. reflect the very colorful lyrics. And if someone's not a fan, and, and that's fine, they don't, they don't get what you and I are talking about, then they don't understand, they can't relate to what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. But they're, they're, if you're gonna, if you're gonna go off for 12, 15, 18, 20 minutes on a song, you'd better take the listener on a journey the way a good classical piece would have or, or a jazz suite or something or a musical. Yeah, yeah you need yeah. to kind of know about theme and variation, recapitulation. Exactly. Or exactly. you could just slam it together. Sometimes that they get lucky and that works too. But yep. I would say Wakeman had a way of kind of, you know, and yes, I think most of it's just started with the guitar strumming some chords and then he came in and iced the cake and helped them arrange it into something greater than it was. I, I think... Yeah, I wish I could be a fly on the wall. There's some great documentaries so often. And again, the, the more I learn over the years about songwriting styles and traditions and genres, especially some of the early stuff just sounds, it sounds like John Anderson walks in with one of his like Irish folk songs. Totally. And it's, a, it's a beautiful song. Like on its own, great. You can go go be part of the folk scene. Sure. But he wasn't interested in that. He's like, what happens if I bring this otherwise fairly straightforward folk song to my highly musical intellectual pals here? And I, I, I literally, when I hear interviews, and it's like they were just throwing ideas at each other. Let's take let's take these two chords that John has and see how far we can extrapolate and expand on them. OK, that's that's now section C3. Right. It's going to need C4. Let's Which, figure out how we're going to get from C3. Yeah, that can be a lot of fun. Now, that also can be maddening, very I'm hard sure. work, tons of trial and error. And you, you can sit there and work out an idea for your fourth section that's supposed to go into the, the third chorus or whatever. And you could all look at each other or put it down on tape. And at the end of the day, go, that's just not very good. Well, we, need to, we need to toss that and try something else. <laughs> you know? Sure. And in this modern age, it's easy. You just cut it up and move it around. But in the early 70s, it's it's for keeps. And, yeah, you know, deep. it's like chop up the tape, you know. Um, and a lot of those, like close to the edge, you know, like Bruford said, you know, we're two thirds of the way through it and none of us know how it's going to end, least of all me, the drummer, you know. Um, but it, uh, it works out. But I do notice that the albums that have Wakeman have more of a thematic quality. Like you can really mm. tell that he helped sort it out whereas other albums like say relay or gates of delirium amazing epic but it's different it doesn't have this recapitulation thing going on it's more like oh, it's, segmental. Yeah. it's definitely different and what what's interesting is uh if i had to pick two pieces by them to me that are just the epitome their, their best their best work i'm i'm moved and i think like every bit of craziness and um just grandeur like it's just so far reaching in its scope uh but it's it's the song close to the edge and it is gates of delirium those are my two favorite pieces of all time oh that's awesome well i love them i love them so much and they're so different you know it was kind of like yeah. you know it totally they're different i mean i think the way gates ends with soon is just so beautiful <laughs> i mean you know it's just like i wouldn't want a recapitulation there i want something kind of they're gonna chill out the war's over yeah, the war is over and you can just, Exactly. And that see, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, that's that is what lyrically that song is about. But say we didn't even know what the lyrics were, and John Anderson was just singing gibberish. What we still get from the arc of that song 
musically again with five rock and roll instruments right not a symphony not a brass section not a string section not a woodwind section we get we get this building up this agitation this turbulence and then this like chaos uh, we get chaos uh, and uh, mayhem uh, and uh, destruction uh, 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 and then like you said it all there's a there's a climax and then a, it subsides in the aftermath and you're like hovering with soon you're like hovering in in it's a release but there's also like a mourning to it it's mournful oh it's almost like the next morning after the battle and the smoke is still right. rising and you're kind of walking across the field kind of assessing the situation and this is this is my point every songwriter or even people who are jamming or a film composer this is the power that they have with the same 12 pitches that every composer has had for centuries and uh, me and my collaborators have chosen to really explore that in in mostly the pop rock genres <clears throat> i've i've enjoyed you know where can we transport the listener in a three and a half four minute pop rock foundation but i'll, I'll use examples like yes or what have you to illustrate the, the the fun that can be had the, the level of art that can be had um and so many of our heroes have, have, have done this but it's also it's always changing it's never not, that, not an easy task um and i'd be interested in more contemporary artists being interested in doing that i you, you'd have me more as a fan <laughs> i'd go to more i'd go to more shows by more contemporary me too you know i mean i just um i heard an interesting quote yesterday i was watching an interview with rick beato there's an amazing indian bass player named mohini day i don't know if you uh -huh. heard of her yeah she's a, oh my god just lethal and um she said there are no bad melodies there's just bad arrangements ah, well <laughs> I don't totally buy that, but I, I get where she's coming from. You know, the, the, arra the arrangement's going to make or break it. Well, I mean, I agree with that to an extent, uh, yeah. because you, I, I would argue you could take an otherwise mediocre, not particularly inspiring melody, and then if you really go to town on the arrangement, you could maybe give it a facelift. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Before we move on, you know, I'm a big Relayer fan. You can see it on my wall back. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. I remember that from last time, actually. Yeah, yeah. The guy it's was there. Um, in the meantime, I had Patrick Mraz on the show. Wow. What was oh, that? He was such a sweet person, man. For starters, he's like, I've seen your show. I really like it. And I'm like, no way. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> And we went on and just, yeah, if you ever have a chance to listen to it while you're just on the plane going somewhere or whatever, yeah. you have to spin because it was amazing. And he had an amazing life before he even joined Yes. Like he was a jazz prodigy. He was playing on a bill with Coltrane when he was like 15 at some jazz festival in Sweden. Didn't know that. Was, then he went on to be a scuba instructor and he moved to Spain and hooked up with Salvador Dali and his art group and taught them all how to scuba dive. What? And, um, I kid you not, Salvador Dali. And um, and then one day he like played piano in front of Salvador after you know, like months of teaching people they didn't even know he could play. And Salvador was so impressed, he said the next week he came back and there was eight pianos in the house. Yeah, no, that, it, that's bonkers. And yeah, he, he uh, clearly was one of those like, um, extreme human beings like so many eggs got dumped in his brain basket compared to other folks oh yeah um and, he's and still, it's he's fun still. to listen to his playing because i can hear the jazz in it oh yeah whereas in wakeman there's absolutely no jazz no nope. and that that's fine it's also like i can hear and emerson's another version of that but uh, it's been fun over the years to learn about the makeup of each of these kind of you know monumental game-changing keyboard heroes oh absolutely and tony banks man you know i just you know you know how it is there are these goosebump moments in prog songs where it just you know especially in a live setting they hit those taurus pedals and the whole room shakes and you're just like yeah this is what i love this music for 
And I think Genesis pound for pound probably has, or Selling England by the pound, pound for pound yeah. has uh, more of those goosebumpy moments than just about anybody. And I think it boils down to Tony's chord progressions. Yeah, you it's, know. It's, the, it's the writing for sure. It, and I, I, like, I like all of their writing that they bring, but Tony, Tony's, like it has this stamp and it's, it's super special and it's super moody. It just evokes so much. It does. I mean, think of like the end of Supper's Ready. Emotion. It's just like, man, I'm yeah. so pumped by the time that happened, but yet I want to cry at the same time. Yeah. There's a joy. Exactly just right. Like, I had the pleasure of covering that in one of my prog nights one year. And I was just like, when we got to that, and I was just kind of in tears. Like, it, it, you, you know how it is. Sometimes you cover something, you're like, I cannot freaking believe I'm playing this. I love this yeah. so much. And here I am finally playing it. Wow, you know. Well, I always used to. I always used to uh, wonder. Uh, I was fascinated by the fact, not being a very cultured young man, that obviously Genesis did well around the world, but apparently they couldn't have been any bigger uh, in Italy. Oh yeah, it was such a stronghold for them and for prog rock in general. But mm -hmm. but Genesis were the, were the gods of the pantheon in italy uh and i didn't i didn't understand that and then over the years as i would learn about italian music and the italian culture and having toured there a bunch now over the years it all made sense because culturally they're just they're they're, you know, they're the foundations of opera and so much great it's, it's just cultural R romanticism and and uh that whole um the scope of opera and musical and, and just how it gets translated. And, and Genesis was the electric rock version yeah. of that, even, even though they came from England. Yeah. And I think that's why the uh, Italians just, they were hip to it because they identified with that in a way that I think it took England and the U S a little longer to kind of catch on to, and they probably caught on to it for other reasons, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, great stuff. You know, it's a, I would, I've talked about that before, how it's like, if the band is written from a guitarist point of view, say Yes or King Crimson, the chords are never quite as delicious, you know, they're okay, you know, <laughs> but they just don't think the way a keyboard player does. So when you no, have and, bands... And vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying I mean, one's better than the other. They're not. They're just different approaches. But the end result's so different. Like ELP and Genesis, it's all a, written by the keyboard player. So you just have this more sophisticated harmony going on. He's got 10 fingers, <laughs> you know, versus the, the yeah. Like, yes, it's almost like, hi, we wrote this. Now, Rick, ice the cake. Sort it out. Put your icing on the top, you know. I even asked him one time. I said, did you ever just bring a whole piece in for yes? And he's like, no. And contractually, sometimes I couldn't because of my solo career. Like when they right. did, like Fragile, you know, he covers Cans and Brahms. That, da -da, yeah. da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da, you know. And it's like, why did you just play one of your tunes? One of the ones that wound up on Six Wives or whatever. And he's like, I couldn't, you know. Like contractually, I couldn't do anything but a cover at that time. So, yeah, it's interesting. Like, are you familiar with the tune Awaken that they did from 77? Yeah, yeah uh, on going, going for the one, right? Yeah, yeah. That's another goosebumpy one. Like, the, just like that's a Rick. You could tell Rick really had a big hand in that one. Yeah. Compared to just icing the cake. Right, because that, that was his big comeback. No, no one knew, including him, if he was ever going to be a part of Yes again. Right. And then he, you know, went solo and did King Arthur on ice and, and went yes, bankrupt. He, yes, he did. You know, I know it's just like if, right up, you know, talk about outlandish, you know, it's like, okay, Emerson, you can have your spinning piano. I'm going to do King Arthur on ice, you know, and, and then he also did Journey to the Center of the Earth. Yeah. And uh -huh. like inflatable sea monsters. And they played like at some place in England where there's a big lake in front of the stage and the sea monsters deflated halfway through the show accidentally. Oh my you know, God. Total spinal tap moment. So there was so much spinal tap in the yes game. But oh, absolutely. I'm sure they probably watched that and kind of cringed. You know, I can't believe there's going to be a spinal tap follow up. I just, I hope it's, <laughs> I'm sure that he did waited this long to do it right. But I imagine the cameos in that thing will just be stupid. Um, yeah, you know? I'm sure. Um, so, um, I'm guessing you're a Lemon Twigs fan. You hip to those young guys? I haven't listened as deeply to their records. I have, there are singles 
uh, that I've heard for sure. I mean, they're they're incredibly talented. Uh, I really enjoy their voices, most of all. Mm-hmm. They, they, some, like when they blend, when they stack harmonies. Yeah. It's, it reminds me of like Todd. It's very, uh, well, it's just very rewarding. Very oh, yeah. Well, you know, they have that sibling thing. So there's this kind of, yeah. you know, just the voices blend nicely because of this kind of genetic kind of similarity, I guess. But but they kind of made, remind me of some, you know, kind of a, not a quite jellyfish, but in that ballpark, you know, this wonderful. Have you interviewed any of them? Not yet. I need to get a little more hip to their music before I feel comfortable <clears throat> asking them. But I would like to have them. Yeah, that would be great. I saw them on Jimmy Kimmel or something a few weeks ago. And it was just like, what a great song. What a wonderful tune. I want to ask you, you've been on, I've seen you on, on one of those late night shows since I spoke to you last. I'm trying to remember who it was. Probably with Beck. Do you remember was, going it was, on? It was, I do been with Beck, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, um, you remember, what show was that? Was that like? I'm sorry. I don't remember. Yeah. We've done so many over the years. Yeah, what's it like doing one of those? Is it a lot of hurry up and wait? Yeah, it's it's pretty hectic. It's pretty clinical. It's pretty sterile because they have to keep the studio so cold. Uh huh. Um, because of all the lights and everything. Oh, that makes sense. Typical for a sound stage, right? Um, and uh, you're dependent on the television sound mixer, which is what. They do every day for a living, so they're really, really good at it. it sound possible to pump through people's computers or their television at home, but you don't really get to hear, right? So live, you get to hear the volume of the stage and that energy and that power, and you can play to it. In the television studio setting, it's so soft and quiet. You're just listening through in ears or even very softly on a monitor wedge and it makes it challenging to like rock out and stretch out um you you feel the nature of the environment makes you feel reserved even if you're playing an exciting rock tune so no nobody likes it uh i always feel for the lead singer because they kind of like you know again when you're playing live in front of a live audience like all right, everybody stand up and sing along with me. And like in a studio, it's like you're playing at church. Yeah. So, and then you do your sound check early in the day, hours before the show, because there's so much for the film crew to get together to prep the show. And then you just go wait in the waiting room. It'd be like four or five hours. Mm. And then you're supposed to remember everything and, get that energy together that you had at sound check or maybe you had at sound check for the live show. So it's really an on off. Uh, you know, you, you feel like a trained animal act. It's like go. And, but that, you know, that's part of what we do. Uh, the more TV shows you do, the, you actually get better at it, but it's not, it's not really fun. Is it done sequentially? Like it unfolds when you watch it or do, are they do they sometimes do the musical portion before they even sit down and talk to the guests? In my experience, mostly sequentially, Okay. but you can, if there was a sound issue or the band made a mistake, that was just so horrendous. There's like, we, we you got to let us do it over again. You can reshoot it, correct whatever errors. And then they, they will cut it in when they say, and now we're cutting over to the music, you know, yeah, that can happen. That can happen, but it's usually sequential. Okay, well, I wondered about that because it's, um, yeah, I figured there'd be a lot of waiting around and probably not particularly fun, but, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes those are your biggest promotional things, you know, everybody, millions of people watch those shows, so it's yeah. worth enduring the, the, <laughs> the pain that goes into it. <laughs> Let, let's just say that the Ed Sullivan show and the Smothers Brothers show and even like... Uh, <laughs> Glenn Campbell Variety Hour or Sunny Shirt, those all look like they were a lot more fun. Yeah. For some reason. Remember that Captain and Tennille Variety Hour? I do. I, I love, <laughs> I'm old I enough to it. remember that. Remember the Adventures of the Bionic Watermelon? That was one of their skits on there. I don't. I, of <laughs> course, remember the Bionic Man, the Bionic Woman. <laughs> um, so, um, so, what became of the Licorice Quartet? Uh, did you just feel like you'd kind of run its course or um yeah yeah basically i mean we uh it was 
So first of all, we were terribly excited and grateful that we were able to actually complete four songs uh, because it was made piecemeal mm -hmm. and long distance. And, you know, I mean, we really raised the bar on that material. I mean, it was jellyfish level material. It was. Thank so you. It, it just, it took so much work. So the fact that we got four songs completed and released to the public was a miracle to us. We're very happy about that. And then a lot of lockdown stuff happened. So we were, in, we were like, well, shit, let's, it's going to be difficult long distance without being in the same room together. But let's try to finish those other eight songs. And the concept of the EP releases made a lot of sense to us. We got a lot of mileage out of that. Yeah, the EPs. The, is there any chance they might just take them all and stick them on one record? Has that happened? Well, they did for Japan. Japan signed all those to one recording. Oh, wow. And I think, I think they had to leave one or two off because they, they wouldn't fit. But there is a full CD and vinyl with everything. Oh, that'd be great. Well, I'd love to have that, you know. Um, do you feel like it hangs together as one album or does it feel like three different things to you? Uh, no, I feel it hangs together, uh, particularly because we worked on all the songs simultaneously. Mm -hmm. The only reason the first EP came out when it did, as it did, is because we were like, well, these four songs are actually closest to being finished. And they seem like they sit pretty good together. So why the hell not? Sure. It was it was more loose that way. Um, but, you know, we tried to have a variety of high energy and ballad on each EP as opposed to just to four exciting rockers and the four, you know, four ballads. We didn't want to do that. Um, so that was conscious. But uh, really, you know, Licorice Quartet started in the beginning of 2018. Uh, sorry, the fall, the fall of 2017. Okay. So, and then it wasn't until 2020 that we actually hear music. And then by 2022, the f final EP came out, comes out. So that's a five to six year endeavor. Well, yeah, five year endeavor. Yeah, that's longer than some bands last, you know? Exactly. <laughs> uh, and for me, it was just like, I was exhausted. I felt we, we, we certainly made a musical statement that I was very, very proud of. And... I, the, the, the thought of then starting new music from the ground up and doing it long distance, knowing how much work went into that, I, I was just like, I was overwhelmed. I was like, oh man, I got to need a put break. energy like else, or at least you know, take a break or something. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's really all that it was. And uh, um, I knew I had some solo stuff that was very close to being done. Which, be, which became Radio Days. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to see that through to fruition. So that's, that's really what, speaking for myself, you know. Do you feel like the, the quartet could maybe resume someday down the road? Absolutely. Uh, j j just like I, I thought it was a miracle that we were all, we all had the energy to like do what we did in 2017. Right. Um, when I reached out to the guys. Oh yeah, I mean, nothing's off the table and I know it would be rewarding. It's just, is it going to be uh, a logical part of whatever's going on in our sure. regular lives? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it'll ever happen, but it'd be wonderful to see you guys play those songs live. I can imagine it takes some major work to, <laughs> to bring those to life on stage, but is there a part of you that kind of secretly wants to at least a little bit? Always. Uh, same with my solo stuff. And I don't perform my solo stuff live other than a handful of things because uh, you need enough humans to pull it off. You got, you got to have at least, five, even with Licorice Quartet, you got to have at least five, six people. Right. Um, and it's really all about the infrastructure. It, it, it just costs too much money to put a show together, pay the musicians, rehearse the musicians, get a sound man ball. And then even if you play a local club show that sells out, you're, you're probably not going to make your money back. Right. So it's a huge, it's a huge time and money investment. And most of us are, you know, have kids to support. And it's this, it's the same old story. Um, obviously back in the days, you know, that's the whole thing. When you're signed, the record company becomes the loan chart. So you get to borrow the money to do that with the goal is it's going to, it's going to reach a certain threshold. That's then going to start paying all the loans back. 
But unless you're a singer songwriter, solo artist, or you're a duo, or you're a DJ, um, or you're young kids in your twenties and you don't have financial overhead and you just sleep on your friends' couches, it's really hard to get anything new off the ground without some kind of financial infrastructure. Sure. Um, and you know, we're, we're long past climbing into a van and driving ourselves across the country Oh yeah, and pl playing people's living rooms. I mean, y y we could do that acoustically, but again, that's just like, what's the point asking a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all for that amazing music. You know, it really um, brightened our lives and uh, continues so well to. You know, we keep talking about these epics. What's the longest song you've ever been part of? And have you ever been inclined to write something that was 20 minutes long? Good question. Uh, what is the longest song? Well, it's either it's either Lighthouse Spaceship or uh, joining a fan club, I think. Okay. Was there ever an urge, like, let's do our own Close to the Edge? No, uh, not, I mean, here, here's my thing with, with so, something that would be that, that kind of prog-ish extended. I mean, it's, it's, that's going to be a hell of an undertaking. And I, like anything I do, I don't want to half-ass it. Right. Um, I've, I've al almost always been more fascinated by what can be said in a kind of classic three and a half minute, four minute pop tradition. Um, I find that challenging enough. <laughs> sure. And um, uh, the thing, you know, whether it was Jellyfish or Imperial Drag, TVI's Licorice Quartet, it almost seemed too uh, pompous or what the hell were we thinking to try to pursue like an actual prog moment. Right. Now, Lighthouse Spaceship just kind of became that. Right. Yeah, even I think that clock's in at five and a half or something. I don't remember. But a lot of that song was written in the studio with the guys. And it literally became like, well, this part's cool too. We can't just throw that away to make room for this other part. Right. And we need a connect section and take it to that incredible outro where Eric goes into that looping and the singing yeah. and everything. But we need a connector. So the connector is going to be another low, like 20 minutes because it'd be too weird if we just hard spliced from the previous chorus. Right. right. So that's that song kind of progged itself without that ever being the intention. That song was always supposed to be like kind of just very kind of Bowie kind of verses and then sing along Beatles choruses. OK. Yeah. In simple that. But that's not what it became, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Well, so that was very that was a very natural organic evolution. Uh, great um, tune, love it. That spiraling out at the end reminds me of like "She's So Heavy" or one of those Beatles tunes that just kind of keeps going yeah, cool. back yeah. on itself. You know, cool yeah. stuff. So, well, cool. Uh, um, I want to thank you for coming by and uh, chatting with me. My today. pleasure. Um, always good catching up with you. Yeah, likewise. I always love chatting with you about. You know, just geeking out over <laughs> 70s music and synths and stuff like that. It's always a pleasure. So I guess we will wrap it up. Mm -hmm.